welcome everybody to the Magic Beans podcast. We are back again for episode number 143. I'm your host tonight and my name is Shorty and I have a couple of beans on the line with me. So tonight we have Chewy. How's it going, mate? Good, mate. How are you? Pretty good. And we've also got Cracker. How's it going, Cracker? Very well, thanks, mate. Good to hear. Well, very brief, you two on your... <laughs> Usually one of you like goes off on a tangent before we uh, introduce the other one. I have a feeling that I've got a few tangents in me tonight with our <laughs> topics. So I'm just, you know, yes. just they're, cooling my they're, jets. They're not even tangents. They're just like on theme. It's amazing. It's like, Chewy, you know something about this. We don't go. So, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost going to be a Chewy solo episode. So, yeah, maybe Cracker, you and I can both stop recording now and we're done. I'll hit mute soon. But that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Just uh, shorting me back for the wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. We will be talking about the Warhammer 40K stuff. So we we're sort of talking precast that, uh, you know, a lot of podcasts have been mentioning it over the last couple of weeks. The, there's all the sort of previews and deck lists and that coming out at the moment. But most people have, most Magic players seem to not have a great deal of understanding about Warhammer and Warhammer 40K and that whole. Games Workshop universe, and uh, both you and I, Chewy, have played Games Workshop products for a very, very long time. Uh, more, more fantasy for me, but 40k was sort of where you started, so you uh, almost you could say an expert. Well, I just doing a quick few maths in my head. I think I bought my first Games Workshop miniature 28 years ago. Right. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I think my first Games Workshop thing is actually Hero Quest, which is oh, I'm not even Quest. counting oh, that. Yeah, Hero Quest, yeah. yeah, which I, I just yeah. like turned wow. around and actually got it on the shelf next to me. So. That's amazing. Yeah. I also the had Space Hero Crusade. Quest is worth stacks now. Yeah, 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 yeah I've, Space I've got Crusade. a box with a bunch of expansions and yeah, it's uh, trading for cool. some jewel land, shorty. No, <laughs> yeah. don't do that. But yeah, uh, Hero, but yeah, Hero I, Quest and Space Crusade were both yeah. Uh, Games so Workshop that products. 28 years isn't counting Space Crusade, which would have been a good couple of years beforehand. So I I'm in my early 40s now, and I reckon I p- first played Space Crusade before I was 10. Yeah. yeah so for me. there you go. Yep. All right, we will get into that. But before we do, we need to shout out our awesome sponsors. So Cracker, you can do the honors tonight. I'd love to. Always happy to talk about Josh and Pat's MTG Bazaar. They are a Facebook auction page with nightly auctions for individual magic cards. You can just throw a bid on there and pick up some sweet bargains. The, the prices are always amazing. Like the bidding never gets crazy over the top, which is always brilliant. And there's also the uh, win it now listings. So you can just every night, again, there's a whole stack of you know individual cards and sometimes lots that get put up. And you just say sold on a post if you're fast enough, and then you just get it for whatever the price is that it's listed. And again, they're always amazing rates. So go check them out, JPMTG Bazaar. And when you do win or buy some cards, please let them know the bean sent you. Very good. All right, so a couple of things to get into before we get to the 40K stuff. Uh, we wanted to just give a quick recap of our sealed event. So both you and I played in this event, Chewy. Unfortunately, Cracker, you couldn't quite make it. But uh, I think it ran quite well. How did, how did you find the day, Chewy? Loved it. Yeah, it was a bit of an experiment because there's no uh, support to play, you know, an organized uh, limited event outside of, you know, ladder or the pre-release events on Arena. So we had to get a little bit creative. And for our first pass at it, I, I think we I think we pulled it off. Uh, it, the feedback from the, from how many, 22 players I think we had yeah, in the end. end? Yeah, everyone had a really good experience. Uh, you know, the... Everybody had had fun. Uh, your stream went really well, uh, and you know we had uh, you know, it's Dominaria Limited. It's great. It's great. Then we just got a chance to play it, and everyone was stoked. Yeah, so, yeah, loved it. Day day went very smoothly. Yeah, good solid turnout, and you made it all the way to the finals again. Somehow. <laughs> again, somehow because I'm good at the game. <laughs> uh, so that the last two one day events, I've lost the finals. <laughs> so <laughs> the the the. The bridesmaid, what can I say? But uh, yeah, I I wasn't overly excited about my deck uh, when I opened my pool, but I, I you know I thought it was workable uh, and functional, but not you know not exciting or overly powerful. So you know I, I went in with pretty low expectations, and uh, against poor Autolycus, uh, his deck was absolutely better than mine, but mana troubles got the better of him. 
uh, then poor, yeah, poor Autolycus got mana screwed and I got the W. Uh, and then, uh, that came back to haunt me where I got then color screwed in the final against Azzy G, uh, who eventually took it down and, and took the top spot and the prize money and those all important envy points. Yeah. He, uh, Looking at his deck list, so he played an Abzan list, and I think he got pretty lucky with his rares. So he got Namata, Namata, Primeval Warden, which is a green-black dude. He got a, a white Archangel of Wrath that has Kicker of Black or Red uh, with a couple of free splashes for the red with, uh, with his lands and a herd migration as well. So solid rares, all in colours that worked, and then the rest of his deck just sort of filled that out and yeah served him quite well a couple of sunbathing root wallers to go with the uh the lands you know he's he was running obviously the the basics in the abzan colors but then he's got a blue white jewel a white black jewel a red black jewel and two white red jewels so plenty yeah, of ways really to good. to get the the domain up so yeah solid effort and uh taking down another one day event that that household mate they just seem to win everything they can magic those guys, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. So it's good to see that Azzy G is finally, you know, starting to catch up to the skill of Sarah Soldiers. So well done, <laughs> Azzy G. But uh, you yeah, close the gap just a little. Yep, uh, very good. So that's the last one day event for the year in the the Magic Beans tournament series. But we've got one more league and Cracker. You want to tell us about that one? Yeah, it's going to be standard, the brand new rotating Dominaria standard. Uh, and it kicks off in just a little while, a couple more weeks, I think it is. And I've been playing a little bit of standard. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I've, actually I've been playing a lot of standard. Dip my toe into it a little bit and trying to work out if Delve is any good or not. Uh, is it? <laughs> I mean, no, mono, maybe mono for blue. people who. Are, oh, mono yeah. Blue. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, maybe for people who are good at the game. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so far it seems it seems like it's it could be well positioned. Uh, I don't know exactly what the build is yet. There's actually quite a lot of choice, quite a few flex slots, whether you're playing Ledger Shredders or whether you're going up to the um, the Telerian Terrors or Haughty Jin. So there's there's like a whole different stack of ways you can build it. So uh, that's interesting and exciting for me. But um, what about you guys, Shorty? How's them mono reds treating you? Yeah, I've actually been playing quite a lot of standard. You know, once uh, once the one-day event was done, it's like, all right, and our next league kicks off in a couple of weeks, better get back into standard. And right off the bat, it was like, oh, man, what is this format is just black mid-range soup, and it just looked horrible. And I found a mono-red list, and it was like, oh, I've got to spend like 16 rare wild cards to craft this deck. No, nah, I'm not committing to that, and then just having it be garbage, whatever. Tried the, the Delver stuff as well, found that to be garbage. And then someone posted in, in our Discord a budget uh, mono-red burn list from MTG Goldfish, and I, you know, grabbed that. It had zero rares in it, so I grabbed that, crafted the couple of cards that I needed for it, and played a few games, and it was okay. And then uh, I sort of, I've been tinkering with it since then, and, and I've added in a few rares and a few small upgrades, and it's actually been doing really well. <laughs> it's it's hard to know my exact win percentage because I'm playing ex- basically exclusively on my phone, so I'm not getting any sort of tracking. But I am progressing up the ladder. Like I'm in platinum, and I'm. You know, I'm going up slowly and then, you know, you go up, you get five wins and then you get three or four losses and then you get five wins again and then three or four losses. So I'm very slowly. So I must be at like the like 60% win rate, which is fine. <laughs> That's <laughs> playing, great. Playing on yeah, my phone. Surreal. So, uh, yeah, the deck's been been really quite good. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. I can definitely post that list up for anyone that's interested. Just just ping me in the Discord. But, uh, yeah, it's um, it standards interesting like it's uh, looking at the the results from like there's a big japanese event on the weekend it was just all black everywhere but that's not really what i'm seeing on the ladder i don't know but what you're finding cracker is are you just seeing black all the time or no not at all so i've seen like i mean i'm playing lower in bronze and silver and stuff so i'm seeing like green white enchantment decks i'm seeing like a bunch of mono blue there's there's all kinds of things running around there kind of just beneath the surface i mean are there black base decks? Yes, clearly. You know, there's there's a really strong package that, you know, just makes sense with, you know, Liliana's and Meat Hook Massacres and Invokes and all that kind of stuff. I think that's just too strong to ignore and will just remain a big part of what is in standard. But I don't know, man. It's it's not as doom and gloom as I think 
it's being made out to be for some people. Maybe like the very tippy top of Mythic, it's different. But I mean, you know, if you're in the top thousand players in the world, congratulations. I don't know you get to complain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been seeing same thing. I've been seeing, yeah, green, white stuff. I've been seeing various mono reds. I've seen like blue, white tempo mm-hmm. lists. I've seen a ton of variations of Delver lists, like different, like mono blue and, and blue red. Uh, every now and then I see a mono green aggro. I'm definitely seeing a lot of mono black and black red and, and Grixis sort of pops up every now and then. But I am finding that my the red list that I'm playing is actually doing quite well against mono black. You know, they're, they're not quick and they're trying to like hit their five mana to invoke despair. And, you know, if they get to that point, sometimes it's a big blowout. Uh, and one thing I'm definitely finding is Shieldred... If if they're not like basically dead when they resolve a shoulder, like if they hit shoulder on turn four, that's really really hard for a mono red player to beat. As long as the person who's playing shoulder is smart and knows that they just never block <laughs> with shoulder, <Shieldred> because <laughs> they block it, it's going to die. But they just don't need to. They just don't need to block with it, and yeah, it's just going to pile up. So uh, one thing I'm finding, like the list that I'm playing is. More a bit more centered around spells, like a, you know, it's playing some uh, some hasty creatures, but oh, it's playing uh, Kessig Flame Breather, which is a card I didn't even know existed. It was from one of the Innistrad sets, but it's uh, two mana, one three, and when you cast a non-creature spell, it deals one damage to each opponent. So that that adds up really quickly. But what I'm actually finding against the black decks is if you go turn one Kumanu into turn two Kessig, it comes in as a two four, which means it doesn't die to cut down. And that's actually super important uh, at the moment. Right. Like having that as a 2-4, it, it just feels, it's like, oh, well now, you know, it, they can't attack with their uh, Blood Tithe Harvester and they can't kill it with Cut Down. And so it just becomes hard for them to kill. And, and then by the time they actually kill it, it's dealt four or five points of extra damage to them. And yeah, it's uh, it's quite nice. So definitely something to look at and, and it does seem quite good in the meta. You're playing Thermo Alchemists in that? Uh, no, the original list did have those, but I, I didn't end up taking them out and um, putting in some of the uh, Storm Seekers, the two mm-hmm. three haste flip guy. Uh, just seemed seemed a bit better. The the Thermo Alchemist, yeah, can work, but it, it was just yeah quite slow. Whereas the um, the Storm Seeking just punch people in the face. So basically, every creature in the deck has haste except for the the Kessig Flame Seeker. So yeah, it's cool cool list. Good good bit of fun. Chewy, have you been getting into standard at all? Not really. I, I've been doing a little bit of brewing, uh, trying to just build a bigger mid-range deck than the the black base decks. Uh, I haven't really had a m- enough time to put into it. I've uh, been pretty busy over the last week or so getting ready for going on holidays, getting all my work done before I go. Uh, but uh, I do like the look of uh, you know, one or two of the non-black base decks in standard, uh, particularly the... Uh, the Naya Invoke Justice list. That's something that uh, I'm pretty keen to craft up and probably jam a few games on my phone while I'm sitting by the pool on my holiday and, and, and seeing how that goes. So we'll, uh, I'll report back when I'm back from my break. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that deck trying to do? Uh, so it's trying to put things like Sanctuary Warden and Titan of Industry into the graveyard and then bringing them back with uh, the Invoke justice uh, which white is invoke. yeah so uh which is four white and one and yeah it's a reanimate spell effectively so uh and it turns out there's some good sort of uh discard outlets in in standard there's cathartic pyre which is a you know good removal spell uh as well as a uh a rummage effect uh there's fable of the mirror breaker of course uh and there is the restoration of a ganjo but probably the best uh, discard outlet going is your opponent's Lilianas. So they play Liliana and yeah. <laughs> Certainly helps your plan. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, uh, so yeah, it's just kind of like, I don't know, I'll just put a Titan of Industry into play on turn five and see if that's good enough sort of thing. I but, mean, you know, you, you're missing all the it. counters as well. Like, that's a terrifying thing. Hello, I would like to have a Titan of Industry. It is now an 11 11 <laughs> with a shield <laughs> counter on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, or, it, it, you, or you make a four four. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that seems really strong. Yeah, yeah. So it it seems super super fun and probably something that's up your alley, cracker. Although I would not want to play against a mono blue deck. 
because like yeah. it's just, you just never got to resolve your spell. Kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is quite the beating. <laughs> yeah, this is that like typical like I may not actually ever cast a spell in this matchup type thing. But at, at uh, least all your creatures are castable though. Like that's the thing with like a lot of the reanimator stuff I've played with is you just you can never cast them. Yeah, you can still cast a Sanctuary Warden or, or a Titan. Yeah. That, that's yeah, absolutely sure. true. And uh, Restoration of Ganjo becomes a, a decent body that, uh, you know, pumps out other stuff as well. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm interested in that. I haven't played played it yet, but uh, I've been still just uh, playing Limited from Dominaria uh, in the times that I've had to, to think about magic. So, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, the mono blues, like, variations that you've been playing, Cracker, I've I found... Mm. When I was playing that, I was sort of trying to do to play, you know, a, f- a few creatures, you know, Delva, Horty Jin, maybe some Telerian Terrors or some, what's I call it, the Ledger Shredder, and then mm-hmm. playing like the, is it Combat Research? Is that the enchantment? That's the one. Yep. That is the new curiosity. And then, yeah, you know, a bunch of things to protect at your shore ups and slip out the backs and that sort of thing. And I just found it kind of seemed like the wrong approach and really sort of wanted to be playing like more actual control, like a more counter more counter magic protect mm-hmm. your one creature and and slowly win that way how how have you found it that's kind of the, the i found a list early on that i just put together because i think i needed like four uncommons and a few commons to kind of get it there so it's not the list i'm playing is actually not got any haughty jeans or telerian terrors and yep. it's playing uh well, i think it's stormwing drake which is whenever you target it with a spell you control you draw a card and so yeah, yep. It's just a little leaner, a little more aggressive, and then, yeah, just a little more interactive as well. So, you are trying to play more of a protect the queen kind of game plan. So, yep. I don't know whether that's 100% right. It also feels like it lacks a little punch because, you you know, you're not getting, you know, with Curious Obsession, you're like a plus one, plus one counter, as or, you know, plus one, plus one. So, it attacking as a two one, even though you've enchanted it, it gets outscaled. So, you really have to do a really good job of controlling the board. But, I mean- you know, you get to just bounce a bunch of things and, you know, fading hopes and then, you know, counter things on their way back down. So, there, there are ways you can do it, but you do definitely have to kind of earn your wins, which is yep. fine. I, I like that. But, yeah, I'm definitely going to look at some lists with maybe some terrors and some gins just to kind of punch through just things that hit a little harder. Yeah, cool. All right. So, yeah, we will do a uh, more of a focus on standard next week. So, we do have the league coming up. 26th of September, this one kicks off. So we're actually doing the live draw on the Monday night. Uh, we do have the extended long weekend here in Victoria. Uh, this, well, the, the normal Friday that we would do it next weekend. Uh, so we're going to do it on the Monday night instead. And the, the group stage will run for four weeks instead of three. But yeah, it's the usual deal. Uh, 500 buck prize point, five, $500 prize pool. I'm reading in, <laughs> Envy Points and Pool all in the same word. Uh, yeah, Envy Points up for grabs, group stage into top 16, and then the finals to be streamed on the 5th of November. So go and register for that. Just go to magicbeanscast.com. You'll find the link for it and get in because it's going to be a stack of fun. And uh, yeah, like I said, we will go right into the standard metagame next week. So on to Warhammer. So Cracker, how much yeah. do you know about Warhammer? Actual nothing. Okay, That's cool. the, Okay, so, like, I, <laughs> I know that they are <clears throat> minis that you play, you paint. Uh, I know that there are many, many dice and cones for areas of effect. Yeah. So, you've got, like, little That's templates like- <laughs> and things to show the damage and stuff. But, like, as for, I have never played a game. I couldn't tell you anything about, like, I know the Space Marines. And I know this Skaven because that's what Chewie calls you all the time. <laughs> and that's it. That's all I got. Just call yeah, it like yeah. I say it. <laughs> Very true. Yep. No. So I yeah like like we we're saying before I I got into Warhammer through Hero Quest and Space Crusade, which sounds like you did as well, Chewie. And uh, yeah, I I got into the the fantasy side of it, Warhammer Fantasy Battles first, and I I think I got my first lot of stuff when I would have been like twelve. I remember having a birthday party and my friends came over and you know I got boxes of miniatures back then chaos dwarves back in the day and yeah started painting and playing and whatever and that and that was what i did like through high school that was my thing like i had sort of magic on and off through there a little bit but but warhammer was sort of the real thing that we did uh, i never played 40k until you and i started hanging out chewy in like my early 20s i guess and yeah sort of just got into 40k because 
you know, that was what you wanted to play. And I think like Darren and a couple of others wanted to play it as well. It's like, all right, I'll, I'll get into 40K. So I'm I'm not super up on the 40K, as they call it in the Warhammer world, fluff. Like in, uh, you know, the, the magic, you got the magic law in Warhammer, they call it the fluff. <laughs> And uh, yeah, more more up to that on the fantasy side, but 40k, no, no, a little bit. Uh, Just reminding chewy. me that a spike in in the Warhammer world is called a beard. So, yeah, 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 you're beardy. Good. Yeah, <laughs> if you're like is, a rules lawyer type person, you're, yeah, yeah, you're being, which is being really beardy. <laughs> yeah, it's such a random thing. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I, uh, as yeah, we're saying the intro, I've been I've been on and off with with 40k for like close to 30 years uh it I, it's fair to say it's probably my first love uh you know into like nerddom uh and yeah i uh started a space wolf army uh before i started high school and i've got uh i've got a space wolf army i obviously i've got an eldar army uh i've had a tau army uh which is a different race they're like the crazy blue aliens and i've also played fantasy so similar uh impact uh that i had on you shorty uh i i built a uh a fairly sizable empire and lizard man armies for fantasy uh along the way as well so i've got boxes and boxes and cases and storage <laughs> containers and all sorts of stuff in the shed uh yep. i i have the original models that i painted when i was you know 10 or 11 uh you can tell they'll painted by a 10 or 11 year old but you know they're my models you know i've I'm attached to them and I've, I've never thrown them out so but... yeah i mean if you've watched my stream i have models on display behind me i've got some more hammer fantasy i've got some 40k i've got the dark angels there so yeah if you, yeah. you tune in you get to see them one in somewhere on discord there's pictures of, of the cases showing what's in there but yeah there's some, there's some maybe i'll dust off a very, couple very of uh, yeah I'll, I'll dust off a couple of my my models that are okay painted when i uh when i stream next and show people a little uh so what i thought we'd do tonight is we'll, we'll go through the decks um so we we kind of know a lot of the cards that are coming out in this 40k commander crossover and rather than just like go through the individual cards and what they do and think about it purely with a uh you know a magic gameplay perspective uh i might just offer the the vorthos or the the fluff uh perspective a little bit as well just because i love it uh i've been immersed in it in a you know in various ways for a long time so uh i've heard other people yeah uh butcher names uh of of characters or creature types and and things along the way so uh hopefully hopefully setting the record straight uh, a little bit so yeah and i actually got these from you guys these decks uh for my birthday so when they uh, <laughs> you got a piece they, of paper <laughs> got a piece of paper with these printed it's on it i who you <laughs> Yeah, so and they ordered and uh, paid for, and they are coming. I'm, I'm super excited. Like this is just a mashing of my two favorite things, like like yeah, magic yeah. and magic and and 40k. I'm super keen to play. I'm and I'm planning on keeping them together as yeah. four decks as a play experience. So, uh, you know, I'm keen to play that. You know, whenever we, we will can. definitely get the four decks, leave them up, and play them on stream once we get them. So keep an eye out for that some point in October. Excellent. Um. So let's just let's just talk about what the four decks are uh, and what they they do in the forty k universe. So uh, the first one is it's the Tyranid Swarm uh, and it is Team of Colors and the uh, the commander is a, a three and Teamer for a five five legendary creature Tyranid called the Swarm Lord. He has rapid regeneration. The Swarm Lord enters the battlefield with two plus one counters on it for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone. So it just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, Xenos Cunning. Uh, whenever a creature you control with a counter dies, draw a card. So kind of setting up what they're doing. But who are the Tyranids or the Nids uh, as they are affectionately known? These are like insectile a swarming alien race that have come from nobody knows where and they just they're known as the great devourer and they literally just consume all of the biomass from entire planetary systems and they have uh you know had various what they call hive fleets uh where they've come in and you know 
altered, you know, whole bunches of uh, parts of the galaxy. Uh, they've got a lot of history with uh, the Space Marines of the Ultramarines chapter, which we'll touch on a little bit, uh, specifically High Fleet Behemoth. There we go, I'm going deep. Uh, but what they do is they have some uh, uh, Vanguard troops uh, where they come in and they'll destabilize a population by uh, creating a cult that worships these guys so that when they do attack, you know, when the fleet uh, comes up in orbit, then this cult then just destabilizes the defenses and, and things. And uh, that is usually done by a thing called a gene stealer, uh, which is a... Uh, a four-armed, you know, aliens, I think the movie franchise-esque creature, and they uh, implant uh, their uh, DNA into a human host and you get these hybrids. Uh, so you get these, like, you know, fanatical worshippers. So in the deck you get some of these, like, pure insectile creatures that are just, you know, this hive mind killing machines with, you know, different focuses, different skills. Uh, and but you also get these human or part human acolytes, uh, crazy cultists that uh, are there to cause havoc and weaken the defenses. So that's that's what the Tyranids do. If you've ever played StarCraft, uh, Games Workshop, they are, they are the Zerg. <laughs> yeah, Games Workshop actually started legal action against StarCraft uh, because of the how closely designed the the uh, the the Zerg were two Tyranids, uh, which were, you know, out beforehand. But there you go. Uh, think- yeah, the, the, the Tyranids are like, yeah, crazy alien creatures with spiky bits sticking out all over them and a million arms. And they, they, they're they the sort of things that in real life would just be terrifying. Think <laughs> like, Starship Troopers, right? Yeah, yeah. And they range from like tiny little ones to like brood, whatever they're called, that are just enormous yeah, and, uh, and yeah, yeah they're, they're they're pretty nuts so very 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 scary one one thing before we sort of continue on any further to point out with these uh cards is they've done the same sort of thing that they did with like the D D sets i can't remember what was it flavor keywords or something like that yes. where they've got so like the swarm lord has like rapid regeneration and then xenos cunning so where, they're in italics right yeah they, they don't actually mean anything but it ties it back into the things from the game and it kind of goes, oh, yeah, this, this ability that is a, an ability or a spell because there is magic in 40K uh, or, you know, a, an equipment or something like that, that that you would use in 40K, this is what it, how it's represented in the magic world. And they, they've done, again, same as they did with the D&D, they've, they've done a really good job of that sort of thing and it just ties and, and marries those two worlds together really well. Yeah, absolutely. It feels really, really good. Uh, the the next the next list the next deck is the ruinous powers. So these are like the the bad guys, and there are four chaos gods that you know, kind of the 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 dark powers that represent. Kind of, I think four horsemen. So there's Corn, who's the god of war. N- Nurgle, who's the god of pestilence. Slanesh, who's the god of like lust and you know uh, being overindulgent, and Zinch. Uh, who is the uh, like the chaos god of all things arcane, and uh, they all have you know different demons and different worshippers have different powers and things. But the commander here is Abaddon the Despoiler, uh, so he is a, a legendary creature, Astartes warrior. Uh, so he's a space <laughs> marine, uh, and he's Grixis and two for a five five with trample. He's got Mark of Chaos Ascendant. That's the italics flavor. Uh, during your turn, spells you cast from your hand with mana, va- mana value X or less have Cascade, where X is the total amount of life your opponents have lost this turn. So you want to attack first, then cast, and you get Cascade. It's just a big snowbally deck. So who is Abaddon the Despoiler? So... The greatest sort of event in the 40k history is something called the Horus Heresy, where mankind scattered across the galaxy. The Emperor uh, went through something called the Unification Wars, where he got all of the people on Earth, or Terra as it's uh, referred to, and unified them as a single people. And then he created 20 superhuman beings that were the Space Marine Primarchs. Then the Ruinous Powers, then the, the Chaos Gods, uh, scattered them 
uh, across the galaxy and they all landed on different worlds and then they grew up on these different worlds and, you know, they've got those influences from their home world. So you get, you know, Lehman Russ landed on the ice world of Fenris. So he, you know, had to fight a wolf when he was young and all the rest. There's full stories for all of them there. It's all very deep. Um, but the Emperor's favorite son was, his name was Horus and Horus's uh, general was Abaddon. Horus plotted against the Emperor and uh, sided with the ruinous powers. Big war called the Horus Heresy all took place on a planet called Istvan V, and then there was about a 200-year war, and the Emperor and Horus eventually fought on the Emperor's battle barge. Horus was killed, but the Emperor was mortally wounded, imprisoned in the Golden Throne. Uh, Horus then took the uh the body of uh of of his primarch uh into something called the eye of terror which is a rift in space time basically think it's just like a crazy demon realm so there's demons there's psychic powers which is magic uh and there's these uh you know race of superhuman beings called space marines which are direct descendants from their uh from their primarch so that that is what you know the the ruinous powers do uh, in uh, in magic. So uh, there's everything here from space marines, chaos space marines specifically. There's also demons, and then there's different cultists as well, which are like just mortal human worshippers. Um, so there's actually crack- a, a Horus Heresy card, like a saga, which uh, yeah, which, which is great. World. Yeah, yeah. So sort of t- telling that story of the Horus Heresy. Which is super cool. And there's actually a variant of the 40K game called the Horus Heresy uh, that have where they go back to, you know, and you actually play out that that game. And there's the, you know, it was, you know, however many thousand years before the current game is set. So, you know, the technology is a bit different and armor looks different and stuff. So it's pretty cool. So, yeah. So that's uh that's a bad and the spoiler with the Chaos Powers deck. So uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Um the next one is Sazek the Silent King, and he's a legendary artifact creature, Necron. Uh, and he has flying, and my will be done is his flavor text, uh, or flavor mechanic. Uh, whenever Sazek the Silent King attacks, mill three cards. You may put an artifact creature card or vehicle card from among the milled cards this way into your hand. So who are the Necrons? So the Necrons are... They're kind of the 40k analog to the undead in fantasy, where they were a super ancient race who figured that they are, were bound by, they were limited by their mortal bodies. So they found a way to transfer their intelligence into uh, host machines, and they are older than the elves, to give you an idea of how old they are. There's the elves in 40k are called the Eldar. And so, like in all sort of fantasy settings, the elves, you know, extra long life and have been here longer than humans and things. So these guys predate the elves and uh, they've got some pretty wicked um, uh, technology and things in uh, even for 40k standard. So they're all artifact creatures and they are uh, silent and they their bodies can repair themselves and they're super hard to kill so they're uh, they're pretty cool uh they you know as far they're a fairly new race to 40k but they're very they, easy army to paint <laughs> very very easy army to paint because they're all just robots right and then you get the little green plastic bits for their gas yeah. weapons it's and, like you yeah, undercoat like them that. with black you dry brush it in some metal colors do a couple of highlights do their green eyes done. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. So, yeah, that's... Uh, so, you know, I'm expecting... Yeah, uh, and based on Sarzek, you no know, mono black artifact stuff uh, is is what they will do there. So um, apologies to Cracker. He'll get a chance to talk when we actually talk about the cards <laughs> themselves. Uh, so then we've got the, uh, the forces of the Imperium. So the forces of the Imperium are people. And one of the things I love about the 40K universe is you instantly go, oh, they're humans, they're the good guys. But then you start reading a bit and you go, but are they? Like, there's there's honestly some are we the baddie moments. Uh, so the the it, it is a 
it's a fascist society that uh, is is held under the religion of the worship of uh, of the emperor, who's interned in the golden throne, and everybody's uh, you know, everybody is uh, bound to his service. Everything that people do uh, for you know the emperor's will. It's a bit of a satire on you know some religious folk uh, or other moments in modern history that may have affected England pretty uh, specifically who it, it's an English game um, again games workshops an English company but uh, so within the Imperium you get all sorts of uh, different like classes of humans if you like uh, but uh, the one of the one of the coolest are what is called inquisitors so it's their job to uh root out xenos uh which are aliens or worshippers of chaos or worshippers of gene stealer cults and and things so they're uh, like a witch hunter type uh class that you know roots out those things and they're generally psychic themselves so inquisitor grayfax is the commander and Inquisitor Greyfax is Esper and one for a three-three legendary creature, human Inquisitor with vigilance. Uh, their flavor italics is unquestionable wisdom. Other creatures you control get plus one plus zero and have vigilance. And then they have a second line, which is hunt for heresy, which is one tap target creature and opponent controls investigate. So uh, pretty cool, pretty on on point for flavor. Uh, and uh, you know that that that's pretty sweet. So, from a, a human's perspective, there is uh, a bunch of uh, inquisitors. There's also the loyal side of the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines, uh, and then there are Imperial Guardsmen, which are your sort of rank and file troops. They look very much like the characters from Starship Troopers, if you need a visual. Uh, and uh, then there are. Uh, your there's the Adeptus Mechanicus. So Mars is a big factory world uh, and they worship the machine god. And there's uh, then there's just like your your regular humans as well. So it's as, as you would imagine, if you've got a galaxy full of humans, there's a lot of diversity in there as well. So as long as you worship the emperor and uh, you stay away from aliens, uh, the inquisitors won't come get you. So uh, it's uh, it's pretty cool so there you go brain dump of all of the things that i love about uh 40k there so should we only should we... just scratching the surface because yeah it oh, is man. i mean like how old is warhammer like 40? Uh, 35 or 40 years old now yeah like it's, it's older than magic yeah and yeah, yeah it, it is drawing on a lot of sort of uh, classic fantasy or futuristic tropes like the fantasy version has your, your classic fantasy tropes the futuristic version has your classic you know sort of cyberpunk-esque and aliens-esque and all, all that sort of stuff tropes and things but it, it's it's had 30 or 40 years of building up fluff the the lore and creating stories you know it was the same as magic used to be you know there was novels and and full storylines and you know we get we get the storylines that come out with each new magic set well Games Workshop's done the same thing with Warhammer, and, and it's just super deep. And every every army has a, or well, used to have, I don't even know if they still do, but you had an army book, and you would buy your army book, and that had all you know your stats and your points values and all that sort of stuff, and, and the rules for how to play your army. But then it just had like, it was just chock full of artwork and stories and the history of your of that army that you were, you were going to play. And like, I, I remember as a, teenager just like rereading these army oh, books and I, poured <laughs> like just, over I can't remember poured most over. of it now but it, it was just so in-depth and it was actually like a lot of it was quite well, well written and you know it might not stand up now but back then it was it was awesome and, and as yeah. a teenager it was really cool yeah absolutely and i've uh, yeah i've read a whole bunch of them and there's actually a thing there's a, a really really great author called dan abnett and he has written uh, a whole series of books uh, on the Horus Heresy, uh, and and really expanded what was already a lot of uh, backstory, and uh, so, so there's actually so much uh, you know fluff uh, and backstory stuff produced by Games Workshop that they've actually got a section of the company called the Black Library that their job is to produce. 
backstory stuff that is consistent and and meets canon requirements and, and things. So that they have these a bunch of people that just write the fluff and uh they and they bring out novels really regularly and it's absolutely amazing. There's just so much you know, they've got literally a whole galaxy full of uh inspiration and, and stories to tell. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's really, really cool. And I know if you're into the book collecting stuff, some of the black, black library books are really sought after. They're really well written and they have a, uh, a, a, a really high, um, you know, uh, they're thought of really highly, uh, amongst, you know, they're actually literature in a lot of ways. So they're not just, you know, sort of fan, fan fiction or whatever. They're, they're actually like a good standalone book. So Cracker, you enjoy, you enjoy a good book. Um, you know, you could pick up, you could pick up a Warhammer book knowing nothing about the game and just be entertained. Like they, they're written, they're not written for necessarily for people that are super enfranchised. Uh, but you know, as someone who is enfranchised, you go, Hey, they got that detail, right? That's great. Where for you, it's just like, Oh, this is quite immersive. So yeah, I could recommend, um, recommend picking some of them up. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that's really cool about Warhammer, like, yeah, it's it it had a had a big period through probably the nineties that sort of stuff when when you and I would have first picked it up Chewy and then sort of dropped off quite a bit because it, it was quite expensive like the the miniatures got really expensive it's it's come back had a huge resurgence over the last ten years they've changed their rule sets and things like that but it's got a lot of those elements of of magic where you know it it is super like mentally taxing and and draining and strategic and all that sort of stuff and and a lot goes into your uh, your army composition you know you you have x amount of points to spend on your army and you can spend them however you want and and that's just very like deck similar building. yeah same as deck building it's you know am i playing two of this or three or four or, or whatever so there's there's a lot of that that goes into it but then there's also the the personalization and customization side of it that you get a lot of in magic as well you know you you pick your play mat and your sleeves and and all that sort of you know your your pets on arena and whatever and that's all sort of showing your personality in warhammer it's how you paint your models you know there's you've got all these books that show you oh, this is what a you know a gene still looks like and whatever but you can paint them however you want and you can have themes that run through your army that makes it completely individual and and all that sort of stuff and it's it's really cool it's a, it's a fun uh super deep <laughs> game that can be quite expensive but can be really rewarding and uh you know at the end of it you you get left for like what i have like we haven't played a game of warhammer for what like 10 years or something probably yeah i I have these really nice models that i'm really proud of sitting on my shelf behind me that i'll be able to keep for forever so yeah it's really cool i I, I definitely would recommend if you're that way inclined to uh to give it a look and, and give it a go all right so let's talk about the actual cards cracker you're we heard your voice a minute ago you're you are still awake over I there. am. I'm still here. I haven't fallen asleep. I'm. I'm like legitimately interested. Like this is cool, and it's always fun to hear. You know, friends who are passionate about a thing, and like, yeah, it's it's sweet. It like I I haven't played. I haven't not played Warhammer because I haven't had any interest. It was just was never a thing for me when I was younger. And when it was you know when you guys were into it, it wasn't yep. kind of on my radar. So it's I haven't Fair avoided enough. it. I just haven't ever picked it up. Yep. All right. So we don't actually have all the. Uh, decks released yet. I think they've only released the full sets for two of the decks. So, uh, which I think is the Teamer one and the Grixis ones. So we've got a few random other cards from the other two set, uh, two decks, but we don't have those full lists yet. But we'll just have a bit of a look through here. And, and Cracker, this is where you can jump in. So <laughs> we were saying before the the cast that you know Chewy is the uh, the the expert in this field of of forty k, and Cracker is now the uh, the expert in the what's going to see you play or be strong in Commander, and I'm just the bean that sits here and does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not about that. Uh, uh, but yeah, take, a, take us through. What, what do you reckon? I mean, there's just a lot of really good reprints off the rip. It's probably the, the thing I'd start with. So I like the fact that the art is phenomenal on all these cards. Like, I'm looking oh, at yeah. everyone, and they're, they're so detailed, and the art style is varied between them. They're not all, you know, like the generic kind of art that you can get sometimes with commander products where it feels like they're kind of cookie cutter because, you know, they've got so much to draw from. And obviously there's so much art and, you know, that exists in that universe, which is amazing to see. But they yeah, all look a like lot magic of, cards. The, yeah, there's a lot of this art that if you took away all the the names of the cards, I reckon Chewie and I could pick out, you know, 50% of these and say, oh, this is that creature or this is that 
you know warrior or whatever this is that character that's that's in the game and and you know be actually be able to actually pick them so they've done a very very good job i'm I'm assuming they've probably commissioned actual warhammer artists to do quite a lot of these yeah i haven't looked at that actually but i i think what you you've kind of nailed it there though where it is instantly recognizable for someone who uh you know has is in that warhammer world but they still feel like magic cards, which was one of yeah, the concerns yeah, that we had is how are they going to make something that's set in literally the year 40,000, you know, in 38,000 <laughs> years from now, right? It's a long way in the future. How are they going to make that look like a magic card that we recognize today? And I think they've done a great job. Like nothing here doesn't really look like a magic card. No. Okay. So, so there's, there's one that jumps out at me though, and it's the Atalan Jackal. And it's, it's a dude literally doing a stunt on a motorcycle with an axe in his hand. <laughs> and the card actually seems good. It's one green red for a 2-2 with trample and haste. And it says, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you must search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So he's one of those uh, human <laughs> Just- tyrannids hybrids. So, sure. you know, so he's a human that lives on, I guess, a world called Atalan. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. uh, he... Uh, he or they are, uh, you know, there's there's bikes. There's a tactic. There's bike. definitely bikes. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> there's like, bikes kicking around. It, it's cool because, like, we've seen a lot of vehicles now in Magic, but I don't think we've ever seen actual creatures controlling them. Can you guys think of one? Is there a creature in the Looter Scooter art? I can't remember. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Like, I don't he, think so. I think you just see the like the big bubble glass, but I think it's like yeah. a reflection. I don't recall there being like an actual creature pilot or whatever it is. And obviously, we've had pilots and things now as well. But anyway, that that one just jumped out at me as funny. And like the names on these cards are, are phenomenal. So there's the one where we talked about like blood for the blood god with a big exclamation mark. There's another yeah, one called so Ma- kill maim burn. <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing. It's what three black red for an instant. Choose one or more. Destroy target artifact. Destroy target creature. And then kill main burn. Just deals three to target player. <laughs> and anybody who's ever known anything about corn, the, uh, the the god of war, the, these are on point from a flavor perspective. They are so good. It's very cool. But yeah. then, yeah, like I said, so the the reprints are really good here. So like a bunch of talismans, which are good because they were starting to creep up in price actually. Uh, the and they've all got art that I imagine is very specific to the you know the decks that the flavor of them, but also the arcane signets. So again, each of the decks has got you know an arcane signet, but the art is totally different. It doesn't look the same for all of them. Same with like commander spheres and things like that. So really cool. Um, and really really cool soul ring arts for each of these decks as well. Yeah, the the soul uh, rings look amazing. I really like the look of the necro one. It's got a creepy skull thing and a rotating <laughs> machine i don't know it looks awesome yeah. uh but yeah there's 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 a lot of really interesting cards without kind of going all the way through there was a couple of ones that i wanted to point out there's chewy i don't know how you pronounce this one Bellacor, is it the dark master uh maybe what's a, the he is a demon noble legendary creature flying demon noble prince of chaos when what, i'm gonna go with color Bellacor. grixis Three and a Grixis. So three blue, black, red. He's a 6 5. I'll read the rules because why not? Uh, it says when he enters the battlefield, you draw X cards and lose X life, where X is the number of demons you control. And he has Lord of Torment. Whenever another demon enters the battlefield under your control, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Yeah. So <laughs> that's in the Abaddon deck, the Astartes, right? That's the. Uh, yeah, in the ruinous powers one. Yeah, so there's a there's a thing that you can do with um with uh when you join the dark side and go to the ruinous powers, you can actually ascend to demonhood. Uh, and sounds fun. Uh, Bellacor, I believe, was a general in the Word Bearers chapter. I'm going deep. Uh, and yeah, ascended <laughs> to to demonhood. Uh, as did most famously Magnus the Red, who was the uh, was a, one of the Primarchs uh, who joined Chaos. So it, you can get demon princes, uh, mm. and you can get fully fledged demons. So a demon prince is a, a mortal that has been yeah has ascended to demonhood uh, through like the gifts of the the dark powers. So pretty pretty gnarly. So yeah, yeah there's very cool. There's um, 
the Herald of, is it Slanesh? Is that how you say that one? Slanesh, yeah. Slanesh, yeah. So that's uh, demon spells you cast cost two generic less to cast and other demons you control have haste. So pretty cool demon sub-theme going on in this Astartes deck, uh, which looks kind of fun. One of the things that I, I remember when these first came out and I said, I hope we get an equipment for the Drachnian. Uh, which is so Abaddon the Despoiler, uh, if you who's the the uh, the commander for the Ruinous Powers deck, he's got this like sweet blue sword, uh, and mm. yeah, it's called the Drachnian, and it is a a demon possessed weapon that like l- consumes the souls and like rends like f- space time. Uh, inst- it doesn't that, doesn't cut you with the sword. It actually like rends the space between your molecules apart and then that's how it actually kills you and then creates a vacuum that like sucks your life force in like it, the the demon inside of it consumes you it's it's super powerful right so Drashian, it's a six mana uh legendary artifact equipment uh with equip two uh, and it has echo of the first murder as its fluff text and when drachnian enters the battlefield exile up to one target creature and its next one is Demon Sword, and it is equipped creature has Menace and gets plus X plus zero, where X is the exiled card's power. So uh, it's it's super super powerful, and it's on theme, uh, and it's awesome. And you know, Abaddon's got that in one hand, and the Talon of Horus in the other, and uh, he's a he's a he's a bad man. So uh, I'm 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 really glad that they made this a uh, and uh, gave it its own card, like on point flavor win. Love it, and it's got the the art is the moment Abaddon uh, found it in the vault, so it's pretty cool. Bit of a moment there as well. Uh, is there a card there, Shorty, that uh, is jumping out at you? Uh, I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm not the biggest commander player, and and sort of knowing what's good. So from a actual commander strength point of view, uh, I'm not going to pick anything. But I'm just there's just so many cards that I've just so hype to see <laughs> like actually on magic cards like blood crushes of corn which are these like red demons with these like f- flaming demon swords that ride on these things called juggernauts and i'm hoping we get a juggernaut card because you can't actually see it in in the art of the the blood crush you can only sort of see half of it but it's basically like siege rhino like a a, a giant rhino that is just encased in metal <laughs> but it's like demonic and these things just like trample you down and and squash you underfoot like they're they are huge and then you've got blood crushes riding on the back of them and then like having a bloodthirster card and then like the the That's this so one seems good. quite powerful it's f- five and a red for a uh, creature demon for a six six it's got flying and trample whenever it deals combat damage to a player untap it after this combat phase there is an additional combat phase and then it's got bloodthirst that can't attack a player it has already attacked this turn so six six flying trample you could very easily just do the rounds of the table it's like yep attack you you take you know some trample damage cool like okay, i untap it there's an extra combat phase All right now i'll attack the next player then the next player like that seems pretty good and that's pretty on point for how powerful bloodthirsters are in in uh, warhammer they are quite Absolutely. strong creatures so yeah. the the only thing i would be hesitant to fight uh outside of bloodthirster is a, a really popular character called khan the betrayer so he's back he's a worshiper of corn and he's known for getting a little bit bloodthirsty and when there's no bad guys left to kill he might just turn on his own uh, troops just because uh, blood for the blood god, right? doesn't matter where it gets spilled. And uh, in the fluff, corn sits on a, a throne that is uh, supported by all of the skulls of the enemies defeated in his name. So, right, it's uh, he, he's, he's a, yeah, he's <laughs> pretty scary. <laughs> uh, and Khan the Betrayer carries a, uh, a chain axe. So think of a chainsaw, but it's an axe. Uh, and it's called the Gore Child. And, uh, yeah, so Khan is a four mana, three and a red for a five one, uh, legendary creature, Astartes Berserker. And he's got Berserker as his flavor text. Khan the Betrayer attacks or blocks each combat if able. Uh, he's got Sigil of Corruption. When you lose control of Khan the Betrayer, draw two cards. Then he's got the Betrayer. If damage will be dealt to Khan the Betrayer, prevent that damage, an opponent of your choice gains control of it. So uh, 
a bit of fun, but you know, there's that flavor of, uh, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna beat up the enemy, uh, good. <laughs> you know, he's gonna, he's gonna, sl- gonna cause some carnage, uh, but he's also a betrayer. So he might come back and hit you. So I, I think that's, uh, a well represented version of Khan and attacks all blocks. So Khan just, he doesn't ever shy away from a fight. So he, uh, he's, well represented as well. So I'm pretty stoked with that one. What else have we got? Any others, Cracker? Uh, there's one more that seemed interesting. Stu actually tagged me in this one today. It's called Mag- Magnus the Red. And it is uh, three blue red for a legendary demon Primark. It's a four five with flying and it's got unearthly power. It says instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast for each creature token you control. And then Blade of the Mangus, Magnus, why am I saying that so hard? Whenever Magnus the Red deals combat damage to a player, create a 3-3 red spawn creature token. Just seems like a really interesting take on like a Spellslinger type deck where the the cost reduction is almost never associated with creatures or creature tokens. Like there's actually... Uh, yeah, it is creature tokens. I'm sorry. So yeah, it, it's interesting. There's there's definitely things you can do to to create a lot of you know artifact tokens and things like that if you wanted to creature tokens. But yeah, I uh, interesting. So it's Magnus, I mentioned Magnus before. He's the first known person to ever uh, ascend to demonhood. He's the Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion. Who and the the creature tokens are actually really on theme for him because as part of his ascent to demonhood. He actually sacrificed the bodies of his entire legion. I'm talking tens of thousands of superhuman troops, sacrificed their bodies to Zinch to ascend. So they are now animate suits of armor, uh, held together by psychic force, uh, and they're completely silent and they move through and like they, so they're, they're all now psychic, uh, or ma- they magic, psychic magic, um, and, uh yeah so that's how he got to demon hood and so the token thing he's cre- his army is now kind of all tokens because they're they're not actually physical beings if that makes sense that's so, cool yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, nice. yep. that's a very sweet way to represent that whole uh, yeah <laughs> that's yeah. that's very cool it's very cool <laughs> uh the other cards i'm yeah glad to see uh have made their way in here so you've got the great unclean one who is the the nurgle uh god uh the which has got a pestilence yep 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 uh there's the uh, i've lost it now the keeper of secrets that's the is that slanish uh yes yep yep and then there's the lord of change which is the zinch one uh no corn though well it's the bloodthirster right oh yeah yeah true yep yep yep. uh i feel like we haven't talked about the necrons much uh because you know they're they're newer and you know the the depth of history there hasn't been so much so there's uh imatek the storm lord so there's a egyptian sub sub theme that runs through the um through the necrons so imatek well, the, sounds- yeah the the undead in fantasy were you know skeletons zombies or whatever but they were egyptian yes. themed and so the necrons yep. are the the futuristic version yeah of them, the, so. yeah that yep yeah. So we, we also don't have many of that deck yet either. Is the other reason no, why we no, don't talk about right. much of it? There's there's just a scattering of those cards. Yeah. So Imatech is a four. So double black and two for a three three legendary artifact creature Necron. He's got Phaeron or Phaeron. Uh, whenever one or more artifact cards leave your graveyard, create two 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 black Necron warrior artifact creature tokens. And he's got Grand Strategist. At the beginning of combat on your turn, another target artifact creature you can control gets plus two, plus two, and gains Menace until end of turn. So, yeah, pumping out a whole bunch of tokens and and uh, having uh, Necron Warriors rise from the ground or from the grave is, is super on theme as well. Uh, so uh, they've just nailed the, the flavor here, and they've just got cool cards as well. Like, the cards actually do cool, fun stuff that is on theme. So I, they've obviously put a lot of work into this and I, I'm so very excited about our, uh, you know, sleeving these up and, and playing them. And I will do my very best to not play them before we play them on stream. 
<laughs> Our game is going to take four hours because every time we cast a card, she's going to be like, okay, so where this fits into the story. <laughs> oh, that gives you something to do while other people are having their go. That's fine. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so I I could absolutely talk about each one of these races for a full podcast each. So I'm, I'm going to put a lid on it uh, uh, and I'm going to, to save it up for some other... Uh, uh, other content, maybe some, yeah, some streams or a YouTube video or, uh, future podcasts. But yeah, uh, I'm, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm pretty pumped for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, ne- next week you're away, so you won't be on the podcast and we're going to do a, uh, a focus on standard, but maybe the following week, well, by then we should have the remaining deck list. I don't think the decks will be out by then, but we should at least have that, the final two deck lists so we can, just sort of uh, wrap up the chat on those two decks once they come out. So, yeah, October 6th or 7th, I think they come out. And, yeah, you should get yours pretty quick, Chewy, hopefully, as long as uh, there's no issues with shipping Supply. to Australia or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And this really gives me hope. You know, we, we know we've got, like, the Lord of the Rings sets coming out. They announce, you know, like, there's Doctor Who stuff coming out next year, all that sort of stuff. It's like, okay. This is one that, as you said, Chewie, was going to be pretty hard for them to do a really good crossover and still make it feel like magic. And I think they've absolutely nailed it. And so that that really gives me hope for these other full crossover sets or full crossover commander decks and things like that, that, that they're going to be really cool. So, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see, and we'll obviously talk about them when they come out. But, uh, yeah, I think good job, Wizards. Hats off. You've, uh, you've absolutely nailed it. And, yeah, hopefully sort of you see that crossover as, as they would be wanting to do in the, in the markets of, you know, people to play Warhammer coming over to Magic and people playing Magic going over to Warhammer. So all nerd culture and uh, all a lot of fun. So that's going to do us for this week. We'll do the usual wrap-up on the way out the door. So as we said earlier, we do have the league coming up in a couple of weeks. So go to magicbeanscast.com to get the link for that. Uh, you'll also find links there for all the different things we do, all our socials, the merch store, links to Josh and Pat's MTG Bazaar, all that sort of stuff, and, of course, our Discord. So just go to magicbeanscast.com. You'll find everything you need to there. If you want to find me on Twitter, I am at Peace Inc. Chewy, you are? At Chewy MTG. And Cracker? At Joel Hill underscore. Okay, that's it for this week. Thank you, as always, for listening. Stay safe out there, and we will see you all next time. 